Welcome, everybody, to the show. It is Counter Clipping Show number 141 for September 18th. I think it's the 18th. It's the 18th, 2023. So I'd like to thank everybody for coming. Um, we're going to start by reminding everybody to like the video if you haven't already. So thumbs up. We've got 67 watching already, which is very good. Um, so thumbs up the video, subscribe to the channel if you have not already subscribed, which I'm sure that everyone here has already subscribed. But just in case you haven't, please do. That would be great. Um, and if you are interested in the Ardwolf's Lair Discord server, there is a link to that in the ticker, which I will put up right now. Big shout out to new patron Chris Anthony. Thank you, Chris. Um, and in the spirit of uh, update for uh, Patreons at the Swordsman level and above, that's the $5 level. Um, I'm actually, I just printed these off and I'm going to be using them. Uh, this These took about... Even something as trivial as this took about six different versions to perfect, right? So they perfectly fit in the bottom. They perfectly come up right to the top below the lid. So if you recall those GMT um, tray dividers that were you could print out in cardboard um, and, you know, so you customize the interior compartments of GMT counter trays. So I've created 3D printable versions. They print very quickly. One of these takes about 10 minutes to print. Um, I print them in batches of seven that takes about 40 minutes or something like that. So it's very, very easy to print. And I will be using them for clipping and organizing the current project while I work on the 3D printed trays. Um, that current project is still Death Valley from GMT and the Great Battles of the American Civil War system. I've had the uh, 1862 stuff punched and clipped for a while. And there's there's a lot more 1864 stuff because there was a lot more people um, involved at the time. Um, so we can now see the new. Um, we can now see the new. Oh, wait, damn it. I screwed that up. We can now see the new highlighted comments, which why is that not working? There we go. So that actually works much better than it did. I'm very happy to see that. So uh, we're going to talk tonight about, we'll get to that, you know, we'll get into the topic in a couple of minutes. But uh, the topic tonight is how many games is too many games. And this kind of arose out of a conversation I was having on the side, um, which, interesting, um, which, you know, often sparks ideas for shows, right? And, and the question is not necessarily that, you know, what percentage of your games have you played? Although that's kind of where my mind went first, right? Uh, before we get into this, uh, well, I tell you what, let me let me finish introing, and then we'll do the roll call, and then we'll get into the topic. So, uh, we are drinking, by the way, Glenmorangie La Santa. This is uh, Glenmorangie finished in sherry cast. It's pretty good. I put like literally two drops of water in it. Fair warning, however, I've got some kind, I think, of stomach bug. So. So if we have to take a brief siesta, that will be why this evening, if you know what I mean. Um, so, um, so like I said, uh, you know, my mind immediately kind of went towards, you know, well, what percentage of games, you know, do we have that we haven't played? But, you know, and that's a kind of common topic, right? Uh, but I think maybe a more interesting question that came out of that conversation was, what criteria lead us to buying more games, right? Because, you know, I think I think in, an, in some kind of absolute sense, we probably don't need more. You know, we personally, I personally don't need more games. And yet they keep magically arriving with the Game Fairy's weekly delivery. So I'm going to use this kind of a couple examples. And I'm going to talk my way through several embarrassing recent debacles about games that I picked up. Not really embarrassing, but, you know, the reasons I did pick those up, and I kind of want to hear from everybody as to why we buy games, right? Um, and, you know, at least one of these games on this list of six, uh, well, sort of more than six, but uh, on this list that I have, uh, did I miss a super chat? Poop, poopity poop, 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 poop. Oh, John Stanley, thank you so much. Much appreciated. Ah, okay, okay. So I'm actually watching a different chat thing now than usual. That's why I missed it. So sorry about that, John Stanley. Let me, there we go. That actually will work way better. So, so is, am I, am I, uh, are there, is there drama out of New England simulations here? 
Um, so I, the, the intent here, uh, John, is not to judge or to name and shame, or, or, but to discuss as a community what, what decision process, you know, what does that decision-making process looks like? Why did I need this particular game? Because, I mean, I needed that particular game, right? So, you know, are, are, are we selective? How selective are we being? Is that dependent on topic or designer or whatever? You know, a lot of, a lot of different factors can go into this. So, um, so it looks like a ah, poop. That's going to be hard to keep track of. All right. So it does sound like there were maybe some, uh, hitches, uh, on the road to getting winter's victory out. Um, as Stigler has pointed out, any, uh, New England simulations is like, I mean, defines small company, right? So, um, if if they hit a snafu, it's gonna it's gonna loom large for them, right? Larger than it might for GMT. If GMT hits a snafu, they're like, ah, it'll be a month late. So what? Here's these five other things this month. So, um, so there's a you know there's a whole bunch of uh, reasons that might feed into the calculus here. So I'll be sorting. Oh, by the way, um, these uh, these come in both two compartment and three compartment versions. There's actually a six compartment version two. I'm not sure anybody's going to use that, but I made one anyway. So uh, they will be available for patrons um, in at the, the in the batch for October. So before we go any farther, before I forget to do it tonight, let me give a shout out to folks that are here. Alan Salazar, Board Gaming Geezer, Bob Moriarty, Charles Latora, F.S. Mora, Half-Ass Gaming. John, thanks for coming. Uh, the legend himself, Fucko, is here. Jeffrey Edwards, John Madison, John Stanley, Jonathan Dyer, Carl Crater from the Wargame Bootcamp, Kirk Bollinger, Kyle Harris, Lee Grant, Marty Sample, Matt Davidson, Matt Taylor, Meandering, Mike Paulson, Pete Bartlett, Pete, thanks for coming. Roger Hemsath, Stacking Limit, Stigler is in the house. Tim Greenhaw, Tom MC, Vicky, thanks for stopping by. Will GM for Food, William Aarons, William Bird, and Winterson. Who did I miss? Because I know I missed a bunch of people. Um... First of all, let me pull that down. Um, hopefully I didn't miss too many people. Charles Latora, did I did I get Charles Latora? Maybe not. Uh Frank Shiuli is here, Lee Grant is here, Egret is here, Daniel Silverthorne is here, Alan Salazar. If I didn't get you, I might have. Um, so Perry Sparopoulos, Eric Gobel. Um, I think that might be everybody. Brian Jarvis, if I didn't get you. So anyway, um, the you know the 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 topic, I like I said as as John Stanley pointed out, you know the the objective here is is not to shame folks, but you know I have often said that that there is a divide in amongst war gamers between what I I guess for the purposes of this conversation, Neil Badke, thanks for stopping by. Um, I will I'll call librarians versus collectors, right? Um, the 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 librarians curates their you know whatever selection of games they have and probably buys a, a fewer num not necessarily smaller number of games, right? But uh, but you know the collector collects and the librarian at least intends to play stuff. Um, there's also, I guess, what we'll call the freeloader who who does not buy games but plays games, and I don't, I don't, I don't necessarily mean that in a way that's as disparaging as as the term might imply. Um, but it, you know, it, it does imply freeloader. So, so probably we should stay away from that particular terminology in this case. Um, so, and I'm not, I'm also not trying to get anybody in trouble with their spousal person. Uh, Dana Shadell, thank you for stopping by. Welcome to the stream. Um, so, and I, you know, I've got, uh, you know, I, I'm really close to the limit of my capacity, right? I could, I could squeeze in another couple of solitaire games, but I'm trying to phase out solitaire games. Um, I am a, a bit pinched, uh, to be completely truthful about it at this point. Um, I should probably consider purging some stuff and probably some magazines. And frankly, one of the things that's on this list that I'm, I'm looking at right now that I acquired relatively recently, and which you will see an unboxing of this very week, I believe, um, is something I probably shouldn't have bought. Um, so see that the uh, hub cam. Got to get to the bottom here. 
Pete Bartlett points out, why are we going to shame people? If Why are we here if we're not going to do that? Um, I've got a, I don't have that many books. I mean, I got a decent number of books, but I, I have a lot in electronic format because I, I like the portability of the electronic formats. Um, so it, uh, on the other hand, there are certain things I want in hardcover, right? You know, fiction and nonfiction that I want in hard copy, I should say. Um, Jason W, um, says that he gets a war game if he is interested in the topic and want to learn about it or a new perspective on the topic or learn that it has an interesting innovation. That's, that's a great methodology. That's a great methodology right there. I think, um, uh, hubcam 210 asks, how about the casual once in a blue moon buyer? I am not that person. Um, uh, but that's fine too. I mean, you know, I've, I've often expressed some degree of envy over people who play relatively few games. I play a lot of different games and it really results in me not being particularly good at any of them. Um, so th this is kind of the root of the question. I mean, if it, it, I, I guess if we're, we're going to decide to fall on the collector side of that divide, right? I mean, I guess that's fine. People collect all kinds of things, baseball cards, whatever. Um, but I say the same thing about people who buy super duper expensive whiskey and then it sits on a shelf. Not that I know any of these people. Um, and then it sits on a shelf for decades and, and nobody ever drinks it. I mean, these things are designed to be played, right? Uh, at least one hopes. I mean, there there are exceptions that I can think of, um, meaning um, uh, uh, I, I want to. I, I, I'm, I'm getting. I got the wrong thing on the top of my head. Um, the folks that spun out out of GMT Fresno Games Association. Maybe none of those were intended to be played. Uh, Patrick of Patrick's Tactics in Tutorials. Thanks for stopping by. Uh, and John from Half Assed Gaming says he's got no more room and he's got a uh, sell two to buy one policy. I, I'm not there, but I really, really should make some space, right? And I do have a a, a, a giveaway slash sell slash trade away pile, but it's not that big. It's like two file boxes of stuff. Um, very little of it's RPG stuff because most of the RP the purgeable RPG stuff went away a long time ago. Um, uh, and you know, as I think Roger's trying to get at here. These are ultimately luxury goods, right? We are not, uh, you know, we're not going to die if we don't get the latest Mark Simonich game, um, except that, uh, you know, I, I might. So, so you know, I've got um, a number of, I, you know, I want to talk about this, actually. Uh, I had it on the list. Um, so Clock Commander 1983, Mark, thanks for stopping by. Um, it, it is all about the, you know, the journey and different people are going to have different reasons for buying stuff. I, I want to give Mark a, a, a mention here because, um, Mark, as, as we know, Mark and his wife are both fighting cancer and, um, Mark had a surgery scheduled for last week and, and did not get good news coming out of that surgery. Um, so I want to extend, uh, the best wishes of everybody that that uh, you know everybody in the wargaming community to Mark and his wife. There is a link to the GoFundMe page in the video description. Um, the prognosis is not good, um, but you know Mark's been really fighting a great fight here too, and 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 he's tough. Um, and I would just you know let's let's be prudent and plan for. Not great news, but I will be delighted to put that great news off for years and years and years. So, uh, so Mark, I, we're we're all with you on this. Uh, we're not really with you on the journey, right? Because it's you that has to live it. But, uh, but, but, but our our hearts are with you, all of them. Um. So John Madison says uh, one of the reasons that he's purged in the past, and you know maybe that is worth its own. Not oh, damn it, uh, maybe that's worth its own show topic uh it was a lack of face-to-face -face opponents buying is hard to justify when vassal is your only option john you got more options in the, that your area than you seem to think you do i'm just saying uh, i mean we both know people that live in that area that play war games that would be delighted to play with you from time to time so um fs mora gets a new war game if they're interested in the topic or want to learn about it, it has an interesting innovation or if it's highly hyped um, you know, I think, I think we're all susceptible to, to, to hype, I suppose. 
But I also would draw a distinction between the kind of marketing hype that we see outside our tiny niche hobby um, versus the kind that we see, right? I mean, I, maybe this is me trying to, you know, not feel guilty about selling extra people on third winter or Pacific War or something like that. But, um, but everybody that's in like the, the content creator space in Wargaming um, is genuinely enthusiastic about what we're doing here. Right. I mean, we're, we're not doing, clearly we're not doing this for the money. Um, and in fact, you know, the people doing this in video game for, I mean, there's, there's a few people doing it for the money, but, but by and large, that's not the case. Um, so gaming community in general, gaming content creation is, is filled by people who are enthusiasts, right? Um, and, you know, I, I am occasionally enthusiastic about this or that or, or whatever it is. So we are, by the way, clipping Union 1864, Confederate 1864 is clipped. Not exactly pristinely organized, let me put it that way. Now, I have, as I've said in the past, I've got a pretty good um, record of, of played versus unplayed games sitting around, right? Uh, however, uh, the reason why I can say that is for because bluntly I'm cheating. Um, I am counting systems in, in that calculation, and, and you know maybe that's cheating um, rather than individual games um, necessarily. Now I got a lot of individual games too, right? But I've got a lot of systems. I follow a lot of systems. Alistair Logie, thank you, uh, Alistair Logie. I got to remember to click on the right thing, and I got to get that, that little icon to be bigger too. And I'm not sure how. Uh, but I'll figure it out. It's already better than it was last week. So, Alistair, the support is much appreciated. Um, the I lost track of what I was saying in the in the context of my stomach discomfort. Um, so, and oh, let me point this out. So, uh, uh, Mark's going to go to GMT. Uh, when is GMT weekend? It's pretty soon, as I recall. Uh, and then restart chemo. Mark, you know, like I said, that, that's tough, man. Just chemo's tough. The, the whole point of chemo is to almost kill you and kill the cancer. So, um, uh, you know, on the other hand, you know, even if we use the term freeloaders, um, I'll be delighted to have people who don't necessarily own the game, right? Um, so so there's that. Um, Alan Salazar says, regards games like he does books, um, resources to be read over and over and sometimes used for future reference. They can provide enjoyment even if unplayed. I actually agree with this. Um, that said, I think they're generally meant to be played, and I think we should try to do that or at least try to have the intention of doing that. Um, sometimes it doesn't work that well. Put it that way. Um, I have totally Matt Davidson has purged games in the past just to reacquire them. Um, I've totally done this. Um, nostalgia is not necessarily the point, although I have done that in a in a couple of cases. Um, I went out, it wasn't out of my way, out of my way. I got it from Enterprise Games, and it's not like I paid a million dollars for it. I went and picked up a copy of that SCT issue 78 or 79. Or whatever it was, that was my very first hobby game of any kind. Um, that's the issue that contained the game Paratroop, uh, or uh, Tri-Pack, I suppose, Paratroop, because there's, there's actually three small games in the issue. Um, Red Devils, uh, Aben Emil, and I forget what the Crete one was called, but the other one is Crete. Uh, and they're all different systems, too, actually. So we, I also hope Mark can make it to Compass Expo. Totally agree. I got to remember to, there we go. Let's just put this in front of here. That will be better. Uh, Charles Latour can probably make room for, give or take, 25 standard boxes without throwing out more. Right, yeah. So I got I got games, not just war games, right? All the games are on five walls. This wall, this wall. Um, there's two walls out in the game room that you can't really see right now. And then there's... Uh, there's an like an excess wall which is all pieces, parts, and stuff, and non war games like like that's where the euros go and stuff like that. Um, so I am damn close to to just physically topping out capacity. 
Could I put additional, could I think of a way to put additional shelves up to store more games? Yes, but my database slash spreadsheet of tracking game for, you know, game inventory is really kind of gone, has not been aggressively updated of late. So um, uh, I would reckon that if we count magazine games, I mean, and I do, right, but I also don't count like individual ASL things as individual things. I just count them as either ASL or ASL starter kit, and that's it. So on the one hand, um, I there, I don't count some stuff that you would think that I would count, um, but I do count some other things that you think maybe I wouldn't count. Um, but all told, I'm looking at, I mean, I got to be close to 500 games. And that's a lot. That's a lot. Uh, I do, in fact, have a, a a Euro Ghetto, as I call it. It's a tiny shelf down here, and it's got about six games on. They're not all Euro Euros, but but they're the non war game board games, right? Um. Uh, yes. Uh, so my wife is very understanding about all this. Uh, I mean, she understands that I'm going to buy games. She'd like me to be responsible and not go go bananas. Uh, but at the same time, sometimes there are bananas. Um, so you you may I, the, the the incredibly astute may have noticed this week's latest acquisition today. Let me know if you you will get props. I don't have any giveaway for this, but if you, the first person to mention the new uh, the new acquisition in the chat, which is visible on camera right now, uh, mention it in the chat. Um, Carl Creator is at 1129 games, 1335 with expansions. That's friggin' crazy, man. I, I don't know how I I mean I'm having I'm having trouble. I'm busting it to see him store in 475 or whatever I'm at. So I am missing another super chat. Fuck. Uh Alistair Logie. Oh, geez. Oh, yeah. Oh, so I need to mention this. Um, so Alistair uh will match up to ten dollars any donation that anyone on the chat makes to go Mark's GoFundMe during the show. Just mention on the chat if you donate. Um, Alistair, big thanks uh for that. Not for the super chat, although thanks for that too. Uh, but thanks for the generous offer. Um, Mark, the, the GoFundMe, Mark's and uh, Evie's GoFundMe uh, is linked in the video description. So please go check that out. So clearly the super chat visibility is not what it should be in this new chat thing. So I'm going to actually switch. I'm going to get rid of this and switch back to StreamYard and switch back to StreamYard for chats because I, I wasn't missing Super Chats in StreamYard. And I don't want to do that. That's that's douchey. So uh, Meandering Mike stopped after 2000. Yeah, I, again, you know, c congrats. <laughs> but, but I got no room for 2000 games, right? Now, I mean, I could, I could... So there, there is a, 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 a geometry-related reason why I don't just put up more shelves in that room, which I could do. Um, I could put an entire, almost an entire wall of additional shelves on there and gain another, I would estimate, 300 to 500 linear feet of shelf space, and that's enough to store a lot of games. The reason I, I'm not doing that is because the room is 10 and a half by 18 and a half. And the 18 and a half is quite generous. Uh, the 10 and a half is a little tight when you start talking about eight foot tables and, and you know, games to take up multiple tables and stuff like that. So I, I want to minimize the, the, the loss of floor space on which game tables can go. Um, so I really don't want to put any more shelves. Now that said, I might put like a, like a headroom type shelf along one side of the wall if I absolutely have to, but right now I don't have to. So I'd rather not. Um, all right. So let me see if anybody has, has, uh, uh, Bravidis Albion says the only series they mostly regret is probably Panzer Grenadier, though for the platoon scenarios, it's a useful resource for other systems. I guess I'll agree with that. Oh dear. Oh dear. This, this cannot actually have really new. I mean, she obviously read it as new England stimulations, right? Okay, this is the least sexy thing. Okay, a bunch of people. War, War in the Pacific's been around there for a while. Um, however, uh, several people have... <laughs> I got a pretty good price. And I want to say I paid for about... I, I think I want to say I paid about 110 bucks for it. Um, the Triumph of Cast has been there a while, too. I have... The, there's only one change. Well, there's been, a, there's been two games subtracted from the shelves behind me since 
last week and one game added and it is the next war uh jim dunnigan credited design by jim dunnigan developed by mark herman i feel like this has a lot of mark fingerprints on it we'll put it that way um but it's a super interesting game i got it for a very good price that i that couldn't say no to uh and that was on the facebook concept marketplace so um, I don't think the maps are particularly great, uh, in, in really any way in terms of like terrain interest or, or in terms of, um, uh, you know, just, just, uh, aesthetic value to be frank. All right. Uh, Neil Badkey is topped out games to sell in another room. Problem is all the magazine is Ziploc games. Zero is about two thirds of war games at this point. I have, I would estimate non war game board games um whenever i make this whenever i quote this i i probably underestimate it by about 50 percent. but i would guess that i have something like you know easily well somewhere between 450 and 500 war games and somewhere between 10 and 20 non war game board games I might be underestimating that. And if we, if we count like some of the traveler board games, then maybe, um, uh, maybe, and maybe I should thinking about it. Um, so as, uh, you know, interestingly, um, it was actually the box that was called out by the seller is the thing that was in the worst shape. And there's, there's a little bit of Boeing on the one side, but no, that box is in very good shape actually. Um, so Tony Mammel asks, do I fear a basement flood fear? Yes, <laughs> frankly. Um, however, um, there are two separate sump pump systems. I have water sensors in the basement, um, and they have gone off a couple of times when, when the power went out, for example, and I was like, seriously concerned that there might, cause the sump pumps weren't running right. This, or, you know, we we're going to huge thunderstorm. Um, and I was like in a panic about it. I, that's, that's one reason why we went and bought a generator. I've already told this story. So, um, so I think fickle is a, probably a fair characterization of this. Um, to be honest, I'm missing a lot of really good comments, folks. And I really apologize for that. Uh, John says that he's in rare form here to say that he's lost most of his love for OCS, but, but, but Crimea, uh, will likely buy from designers he knows and likes personally. I still like OCS just as much as I did, but I mean, you got to recognize what OCS is good at, right? Um, so, folks, I am going to apologize for this, but I am going to take a brief break and be right back. Uh, shouldn't take even five minutes, so we will be back momentarily.
Okay, we are back. I apologize for that. As I mentioned earlier, we've got something of a stomach bug going on. So light a candle is right. Um, you know, one thing that does not make a great combination with scotch is the taste of Pepto-Bismol. I'm just saying. That is what I'm saying. So, I mean, you know, the the, the point, I guess, of the conversation is to talk about... I'm going to have specific examples here, right? So, recently, you're going to see an unboxing video of... And I, I, th I think I will not communicate this in the unboxing video, just because I didn't think of it at the time, because I filmed it like two weeks ago. Um, so... North Africa 41, Mark Simonich game, redo of Mark uh, Simonich's much earlier game. Um, I want to make sure I'm catching these. Um, Fucko, thank you so much for uh, for that donation. Much appreciated. Um, I, You know, I could do this, but it's very echoey in the bathroom, and it would be a bad, a bad audio experience for the viewers. I haven't had Chipotle in a while. Now, I think this is something, I think this is an actual stomach thing. It's been, it's been bugging me for a couple of days. And I've got like tw like 10 hours of seminars and stuff at, at work this week that I am running and uh, that that could potentially be really, really uncomfortable. So um, so I'm hoping that that it won't be that bad, but it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's not doing great right now. So, um. So, and again, thanks, a uh, big thanks to Alistair on this too. Um, John Clark says, if you tie it in books about gaming subjects and then the corresponding games, it becomes a battle of space. That's true, but I got way more um, uh, shelf space tied up with games than books, frankly. I mean, unless, we, unless we're counting RPG books, in which case it's a little more even, but not quite even. Um, Greg Grant really wishes OCS would do something more interesting than another massive East Front game. Um, I mean, I can understand that instinct, but I really like the massive o OCS East Front games. So um, I think that's one of the better East Front experiences one can have, in fact. So so there's that. Um, so North Africa 41. And, and I had thought that I didn't order it, and it, it turns out... Let me adjust this. Tried to do this before the show and it just didn't just didn't quite adjust. That's that's a little bit better. Um, so I had thought that I I had not ordered it, and I I think it was my intention to not order it. And evidently, at some point, I forgot that I had made that decision and ordered it. Um, because then I'm like, oh, I just got charged for North Africa forty. Did I order that? I don't remember ordering that. But I ordered it. They sent it to me, and it's it's nice, right? I mean, and and the number of uh, I let me put it this way: um, if Mark Simonich has done a bad game, I haven't seen it. Um, I th I have a very high opinion of Simonich as a designer. Um, it's not a Zoc Bond game because there's no Zoc Bonds in it, but it's a thorough revision of that earlier game, The uh, Legend Begins, right? And you know how how badly did I need that? Really, I mean, remember that, and I, as I've said multiple times, North Africa is not a topic I am super duper into. I'm not like completely uh, oblivious to it. Uh, but the fact is, I've already got kind of a bunch of North Africa games at, at various scales, right? I've got a variety of games that handle the entire thing from 1940 to 1943. Um, I've got a couple of games, well, I kind of have a couple of games that do that. There's not that many of those. Um, uh, I've got a bunch of games on the Western desert. Um, I have probably got eight or 10 North Africa games. I, I didn't need another North Africa game. I, I just didn't. Um, so I guess the good news for the viewers is that, that that's probably going to go away in some kind of sale or giveaway or something like that at some point. Um, I just really probably oughtn't have picked it up. Um, that, that is, that is not in any sense a statement about the quality of that game. And that's why I'm using that example, um, because it's, you know, it's a Simonich game, right? There, there's If there's a bad Simonich game, I mean, I, I invite anybody in the chat that has an opinion on which Simonich game stinks, uh, but because I haven't seen it. Um, 
Uh, John Madison says that the Simonish series has become one of his new favorites, soloing Stalingrad 42, which, I mean, they're all, I, I really like them all. Um, and there are reasons why I would, I I, I think North Africa 41, I think is probably going to, is going to be good, right? I, I, I expect that to be a good game. Um, at the same time, um, I didn't need another North Africa game. I've got <clears throat> two BCS North Africa games, one on the Western Desert and one on Tunisia. Um, well, one on Kasserine Pass and one on Operation Crusader, I suppose. But still, um, I've got Desert Fox Deluxe. I've got War in the Desert. Um, I've got the African Campaign. Um, there's at least two that I'm just forgetting about, for example. Um, and here's another one. Um, and, you know, if a, a copy of Campaign for North Africa ma ma magically materializes for a price I want to pay, I'll buy those. And I've got DAC and DAC 2, right? So, I mean, I am not starved for D North Africa, which are both Western Desert, by the way. Um, um, so I, did I need that? Did I, what was the decision-making process? That's a great question because I don't remember making that decision. I just remember it, it getting charged and <laughs> I don't remember ordering it. I mean, I may have just ordered it because, oh, it's a Mark Simonich game. I'm sure it's going to be great, which I'm, I still believe to be the case, right? I just didn't see why I needed it. And and, and then it, now it's here. So um, so there's that. I also would like to see um, a revised North Normandy 44 to include the counterfactual scenario and the uh, Cobra thing that we keep hearing about or were hearing about some years ago um, and uh, has never materialized. Elster Logie says he got an unboxed copy of DAC for a decent price. Can you use the DAC 2 rules? No, you can totally use the DAC 2 rules. In fact, uh, that's one of the reasons that the DAC, that DAC 1's price is still as high as it is, uh, because you can totally do uh, DAC with ma DAC maps and counters with DAC 2 rules. That's not a problem at all. Um, now, I don't have the Gamers North Africa, which is basically DAC in SCS. So that that's a, a a perfect example of well, what were you thinking when you bought when you when you bought this game? I, I wasn't, I wasn't. As has been mentioned, the comments are coming really fast here, folks. As has been mentioned in the chat, FOMO, fear of missing out, is totally a factor, right? I don't want to think about. I mean, I've bought a number of things. I bought time for trumpets for that reason. Um. Okay, there are some contrast issues on the DAC two counters. I think that um, yeah, I'm pretty sure that was DAC two that I saw. Now the good news about GTS, and, and you know, part of my buying is driven by series buying, right? If there's a new BCS game on the way, I will buy it. Whatever, just shut up and get sent it to me. If there were to be a new Great Battles of History or Great Campaigns of the American Civil War or a number of other things, uh, series, I would I would buy those. Um, sight unseen, questions unasked. Um, and, and I guess that's fine. Uh, but, but thinking about it, there are... I'm writing this down because I wrote this down and I knew I was missing stuff. So there are, by my reckoning... Uh, so when I say series in this context, what I don't mean is no, John. I think this would be awful. Um, I, I gotta, I gotta be honest. Um, I think this would be awful. I think the scale's not right for it. Um, you'd have to re dramatically rescale it. I think BCS Guadalcanal would also be terrible. I think neither of those systems is particularly well suited to the kind of conflict you saw on Guadalcanal. That's not to say the whole Pacific, uh, but that that is to say Guadalcanal specifically. Um, Half-Ass Gaming asks if anyone has ditched OCS for BCS. Uh, I have not. Um, however, I can appreciate um, that some of the features that people liked about OCS are maybe cleaner and more simply... Uh, uh, materialized in 
um, BCS than in OCS. And by the way, John Stanley, if I didn't say this, thank you for the support. It is much appreciated. Patrick of Patrick's Tactics and Tutorials is doing final proofing for GCACW4. Should go on pre-order in the next couple of weeks. That's awesome. I will be happy to buy it. No problem. Michael Schmaus says fear of missing out is his number one reason. Mike M says FOMO is a big problem. The online vendors and shipping seems to have gotten worse. Uh, I feel like those are two not causally connected things. I mean, shipping is largely out of the hands of online vendors, right? Um, although, you know, it, it is possible to do better at shipping on a cost basis than sometimes we do. Um, that's, that's plausible. Um, yes. So Uh, Greg Wren points out that the, the person who is the designer of Luzon, whose name I don't recall, who is a, a, a person from Japan, um, is also working on a uh, earlier war Burma game. That's going to be like South Burma, I think, something like that. Uh, that would be very interesting. Um, I would I would be interested in that. Uh, but again, OCS is one of those things where you don't really have to sell me on the new OCS game. I'm just going to buy it. No, that's no problem. Um, stacking limit ditched OCS for BCS. And again, I can, I have not done this, but I can, I think I understand. Um, I think I understand the instinct at play there because frankly, so now, now that I'm, I have a slightly more complete list. So this, like the series of which I will buy, you know, whatever they do, I will just buy them. Library of Napoleonic battles, BCS, OCS line of battle, uh, GBOH, GBACW, GCACW. Um, and uh, that's, that's the whole list. Um, in addition to that, there is one additional series, and, and I have everything for all of those games with the caveat that I do not have all of the SPI GBACW. I just have all of the GMT, and I have some of the SPI. Um, Stigler doesn't feel so. Stigler is is fortunate though in, in that you know he, you know Stigler. Correct me if I'm I'm wrong about this but you seem to mostly play a few different carefully selected game series right and and i, I think that's great right i would love to do that um i do not do that i do not do that at any point um pete bartlett thanks for stopping by two full days of driving hopefully uh you continue to be safe Nordic Maelstrom has a question about uh, Musket and Pike, which I have not yet played, so don't ask me. But if anybody's in the chat, can infantry and cavalry under charge wing orders move and declare a charge in the same phase? Uh, feel free to answer him on that. Um, <clears throat> James Whitmer says shipping costs are helping limit purchases, which I completely sympathize with, right? Um, I did pretty good. I think I paid 25 bucks to have the next war shipped here. And considering it's a big box, I'm fine with that. Uh, William Aarons can attest that my basement gamer is a marvel of cosmic chaos, a model of unplanned, unplanned fractal complexity. That that sounds extremely dramatic, um, and I don't quite feel quite that bad. It, it's you know all there's there's a number of games sitting on tables at this point. Let me put it that way: not games set up on tables to play. There's one game set up on a table to play, and that's still Mister Fucking President. Um, but, um. I, I got I need a little bit more space and or get rid of a few things. Let me put it that way. I don't need to get rid of a ton, uh, but I've also got a plan for for incoming stuff, right? When the new library to playing battles game comes out, it's I'm out of shelf space on that shelf. Um so um Eon Tishy. Uh, let me know if I'm pronouncing that badly or not. Um has 68 games and eight on pre-order. Stacking limit is 80 and he will sell games in order to stay under that limit and he also follows the Stigler modus operandi which I have you know like I said I approve I I don't do that but I approve of that um I will I will I will push back on easy to learn we we found it fairly challenging to learn but once you have it down it plays very smoothly I will agree with that I feel like our, you know, just uh, wargaming experience actually worked against us in the case of at BCS a little bit, as I've talked about before. Um, well, okay, that's fine. I mean, ultimately, you're a grown up. You made the decision, right? To hey, you really like this system. You're you're going to play more of that, right? And it may just be as simple as a matter of as time, uh, time budgeting, and that that makes completely sense. 
Um, cool stuff may still have GMT, but they effectively have no other war games at this point. Um, I do sometimes buy stuff from Miniature Market, which does still have some war games. Um, but they don't sell. One of the reasons I was going with um, cool stuff was cool stuff had MMP stuff. Um, and uh, Miniature Market didn't and still doesn't. Um, so um, at this point, I just pre-order from MMP. Uh, I am I am caught up on MMP as far as uh, current selection. Um, if I thought hard enough about it, I'm sure there would be things that I would like to get that are out of print, but they're out of print and long out of print. But then again, I, I may have acquired all of those already. Um, so, well, if, if maybe we'll talk about this at some point, but yeah. So cool stuff has been at Origins for the last 10 years at least, right? Ex until this year, but for the last at least couple of years, and bear in mind that we did have a COVID break in there, um, they brought no board games whatsoever. It was all just magic cards and, for, and or Pokemon cards or whatever it is that they were selling, but it was all, all that. Uh, I think they, Noble Knight would give you free shipping over 100 or 125 or 150 or something like that too. Not Miniature Market will give you free shipping over 100 and sort of cool stuff. And that was another reason why I, I bought from them. So another thing that I picked up recently um, that, you know, maybe was not in the most incredibly, incredibly great idea was the next war, right? I do think it's a very interesting design. It's, it's clearly a predecessor of the 85 series from Thin Red Line. Um, I had it back in the day. There's a, certainly a nostalgia factor. There's certainly a deal factor. It was like, hey, I saw it for 80 bucks. I'm like, ah, I, I can't, I can't really say no to that, can I? Um, and it's unpunched inside, by the way. The uh the box is not near mint, but the box is in better shape than the war in the Pacific box. I and mean, I paid like $280 for that. So um if if cool stuff has decided that Marty, if cool stuff has decided that their best business model moving forward is CCGs and fulfilling Kickstarters, then I hope that model is successful for them. But that I have I no longer have any reason to shop there. Um, that's not me being pissy. That's just I I'm not interested in that stuff. So okay, I, I mean okay, I'll buy from somebody else. Um, Roger Hemseth says, BCS, like so much which is new, is overhyped and under-evaluated. I don't feel like BCS has been under-evaluated, though. I think it's been the subject of uh, a fairly intense play and scrutiny. Um, it's not like... Now, I, I would tell you, though, that, that, that this phenomenon, on the whole, is totally real, right? Um, we had, for example, a game, and I think Stigler will agree with me um, on this, is that released in you know, several years ago from Decision? Then I'm talking about Desert Fox Deluxe to rave reviews. Um, but when people started putting it on tables, and that took a while, um, some issues were discovered. Okay, so, um, so there there is a sort of I don't want to say hype because I I think I think that term is overblown and implies some things from mass media that don't necessarily apply to wargaming but but like certainly under analysis and like overall positive buzz or vibes um that are maybe not yet warranted uh is a thing that we see i'm only suggesting that maybe we we aren't seeing that from bcs a lot of people have taken a, a bcs apart in, including you know a bunch of people with youtube channels um and mark herman right? Who spent a bunch of time chronicling his own play of BCS. So um, I, I can think of examples where this is the case. I just don't think that BCS is, is one of them particularly. I think BCS is exceptionally well thought out and exceptionally interesting in its ability to boil down a lot of the factors, which in other games, including OCS, you do have a bunch of rules for into basically a couple of different die rolls. Um, so uh nordic maelstrom and carl fung points this out uh so scs in general does not have chit draw but panzer battles specifically does have chit draw um i'm not sure if there's another one that has chit pull or not but panzer battles is the one that i think frank davis says he's read about 100 books on the pacific war and his appreciation of the topic continues to grow each book he read seems richer than the last because of all the knowledge he's developed 
Unfortunately, a specific game library glows, grows less satisfying as his historic knowledge increases. The more specific games he acquires, the less he admires what has been done to date, but he's still buying and hoping to find the decisive Pacific board game. Does anyone else feel games lose value in inverse? Oh, and Frank got cut off there. Sorry about that. So this is, a. I think what Frank's getting at um, is, is one of the reasons why we keep buying games that maybe we don't need um, because there's something unsatisfying about the games we currently have. And we're looking for a game that is more perfect than wh whatever it is we have on the subject, right? Um, I think that I don't feel like that has been the case for me in wargaming, but I do kind of feel like it has been the case for me in, in RPGs. Um, and I think in both cases, I've kind of grown out of that. Uh, well, in Wargaming, I don't think I <clears throat> I was at that point at any particular point. Uh, but in RPGs, I definitely was. Um, and I, I kind of just gave up on it because, frankly, I decided, look, I'm just going to be satisfied with Chaosium and, and Traveler and, and that's it. Um, and that was a decision that I made, right? And I've, you know, I've tried to stay a little more focused in Wargames, but... Pfft, that that's that's going poorly um nordic maelstrom hasn't been in the hobby for long but has really taken a love to chip draw activation for especially for solo play have you tried gts because i highly recommend it um stigler has yet to see or hear of an ar play through a single completed game of desert fox deluxe that is telling so i'll agree that it's telling but on the other hand the, the whole thing is a big game um you, you haven't necessarily heard that many reports of complete playthroughs of, say, Third Winter, right? And I can vouch for that. I mean, I've, I've sunk 100 hour, 150 hours into Third Winter at this point. It's probably maybe more than that. Carl mentions, and this is a legitimate factor, too. Um, he says that war games, more than other board games, take a while for the public to digest because their complexities, uh, sometimes buyer remorse takes a while to discover. This is true, right? I mean, if I might buy a highly anticipated war game and I'm super pumped about playing it, and this happens, um, and not get to play it for two years because that's just the way the schedule works, right? Um, so there's like a, a, a you know logistical bottleneck uh, factor that that can be a factor. Um, and at the same time, I uh, sometimes I'm so excited, um, as was the case with Pacific War, that I am super pushy and. That's yellow. I'm having contrast issues in this light. Mm, so. Okay, so still says if it were done right, it would be a classic since it spans from Casablanca to Cairo. So there's there's really only we did that. We talked about this actually in a previous show. There's only a few games that cover all of North Africa in World War II meaning starting in mid-1940 and going all the way to the final conquest of Tunisia in 1940. Um, there's there's a few games that do that, not very many. The ones that spring immediately to mind are Desert Fox Deluxe, War in the Desert, and um, Shifting Sands. Um, I There might be one or two others, but it's not... Uh, uh, boy, I'm gonna. I I don't know how more firmly I can disagree with this statement, Roger, because um, I think BCS is doing a lot that's that is completely fresh. Um, that I, I think I think it's doing a lot that's completely fresh. Let me put it that way. Now, are those necessarily uh, you know like ex nihilo innovations? As we've discussed before, there that that doesn't really exist, right? Uh, they're evolutions of previous and, and recombinations of, of various older things. Um, oh, Alan Tales, our oldest game <coughs> that I have that's so far unplayed. Uh, 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 Frederick the Great. I, I, I'd have to actually time this out. No, I take that back. I have a copy of... We, we may or may not decide that this is a war game. I, I have a copy of... Um, Origins of the Second World War, which is a 70 or 71 or 69 or something like that game. And I haven't played that. Um, 
Uh, GTS is the Grand Tactical Series from Multiman Publishing. Series designer Adam Starkweather. Current series Honcho uh, Joe Chacon. Um, there is one, two GTS games on pre-order right now. One is the reprint of The Devil's Cauldron, which is a masterpiece. Uh, and the other is G, uh, oh, bleh, The Greatest Day Utah Beach. Oh, this is a very interesting statement. I keep so I have a search. I'll mention, I'll throw this out there in case anybody does. Um, I need not need need, but I would love uh, SPI soap boxes. Just the boxes. I don't need the games. I don't care what condition the game is in. It could be completely missing for War in the Pacific and or Objective Moscow. If anybody's got extra boxes later on, let me know. Not flats. The soap boxes. Um. Uh, John keeps buying games because he's OCD and should never have been given a credit card in conjunction with the hobby. I understand that. Um, I do have a kind of a budget that I stick to most of the time, most of the time, most of the time. Um, where where the budget gets blown is when there's a big convention and there's like a uh, just you know a target rich environment and there's just too many games that I could buy, so I do. Um, so. Uh, presumably, we're talking about um, Desert Fox Deluxe. Um, there, there are some significant issues with Desert Fox Deluxe. I, I think there is a good game there, um, I, but you, you do have to kind of work with it um, and or make it work if you are going to make it work. And that's you know yet another one of those decision games project type type acquisitions. Speaking of which, is another game that is on my list, Storm of Steel. Now, this is a reacquisition. Um, I had had the original, I've talked about this already. I'd had the original uh, first printing of, there was really only one printing, the first version of Storm of Steel. They did it, they did an expansion slash update kit. It's really an update kit um, with a revised rule book and a bunch of other doodads. Um, and that really enhances play. And while you could get most of the other doodads on the internet, um, I really wanted the, the, the officially printed stuff um so i dumped the original game and and i just recently at wbc rebought it uh from decision in the second ver second quote unquote edition okay um i just want to make sure i didn't miss another super chat here so bear with me okay i think we're good oh no alan salzar thank you so much much appreciated um, I, I would have seen this. I just, I'm in the middle of scrolling down. 1776 came up, came uh, out after, uh, pretty sure it came. What, Frank, what year was Frederick the Great? <laughs> the designer is here, so maybe he will say. Um, Frederick the Great might be, um, it definitely doesn't predate uh, origins of the Second World War, I can tell you that. Oh, and Mark, Mark Ruggiero sent me uh, Caesar's Legions, which is... Um, is very early 70s as well as i recall uh maybe not maybe it's mid to late 70s because that's the game that was originally eagles from a uh, lauren wiseman game from um uh, ddw and i have played 1776 by the way uh so Car i'm gonna defer to carl on this but i thought i thought i heard that joe was the joe was the honcho so or whatever. I don't know what the title would be. It's the guy, you know, the guy with the with the big red button. So. All right. I'm going to get uh, down here. My oldest unpunched game is probably Freddy the Great. Uh, but bear in mind, I have two copies, too. And I have a punched Avalon Hill copy and an unpunched SPI copy. And it's that might be the oldest one. Maybe, maybe, uh, maybe not. Uh, you know, uh, set up out. Oh, Frank says that uh, Freddie the Great uh, published in seventy four, seventy five. So it's it's pretty old. It's definitely on the bottom. Uh, as far as I know, Iron Bottom Sound is there a new version of that coming from somebody? I thought so. Um, I'll tell you what. I don't know if Iron Bottom Sound three is any good or not, but the cover is amazing. So that's 
that's probably my very favorite war game cover is that that cover um it's a really good cover Um, I think there's a really good game in Storm of Steel too. I do think you got to work with it somewhat. I think it's it's a little bit of one of those classic decision kits, um, which they're trying to get away from. To what extent that is successful, we'll see. You know, we'll, we will continue to see. Let me put it that way. Okay, so Alistair is offering. I'll, I'll remind everybody that Alistair is matching up to ten dollars in donations to Mark and LV's GoFundMe, which is linked in the video description. Um, if you haven't given yet, you know, any amount is great. Um, but if you do during the show, mention it in the chat and, and Alistair will match it, um, which would be great. Uh, yeah, it, it, it might've been 75, but I mean, 70, that, that was the point, right? So it was, it was right there. Um, I mean, it's, you know, you got what you got, right? You got the time you got and the games you got. So $10, $10 per donation, right? Ooh, so I have kept Panzer Blitz. I don't. I mean, I've never owned Panzer Leader, and I've never played Panzer Blitz, and it's passed through my hands about three times. I have kept it because a, it was cheap. Um, b, I would actually like to play it at some point, and it's not like that's a huge effort. Um, ooh, you're the rat. Good, good one. Good one. Uh, John Longshore says is most shameful. I'm trying not to shame anybody, John. Um, is the entire TSWW series and hasn't even looked at any of them. So I have looked at at both Singapore and the Balkan hell, uh, Balkan Fury that you gave me. And I, if I try it at all, it's going to be with Balkan Fury, right? Um, and it's I was clipping it on the show not that long ago, and it's I, I I do feel like that series has some things going for it, but it's got it's got a lot it's got a lot of uphill to go. I mean. Um, if they could completely digitize it, that might be the like the game, the, like a literal game changer, actually. So Jonathan Dyer has put up 10 bucks. Thank you so much. Uh, Nordic Maelstrom says the oldest game he has is Hitler's Last Gamble from 3W, which is punched. Well, there's a new version of it coming, and it's going to be basically a completely different game. Um, I probably should have a copy of the original. Greg Grant also, and I sympathize with this, not with the Cold War Gone Hot so much, but I'm um, sp focusing on specific series. Um, I mean, you're you're picking a hot topic too here, right? Ha <laughs> ha. But um, there's also on oh, Stigler has has uh, thrown some in as well. So thank you, Stigler. Um, you're picking a hot topic here with Cold War Goes Hot, right? That's uh, that's one of the the more happening. Uh, niches in the in the hobby at the moment. Ugh, SPI's scrimmage. Wow, I would love to actually look through that. To be completely honest, um, just to see it. But I'm not going to go run down a copy of friggin' scrimmage. Carrier is another interesting, uh, John from half -S Gaming mentions uh, Carrier, and that's an interesting uh, game as well. I haven't picked up Carrier Battles Philippine C, and I'm, I might do so at Compass X, but we'll, we'll see. I just decided to not buy it, and, you know, you, you have regrets, right? So um, another game that I picked up, and I don't regret this at all, because I think this is a unique game with something unique to say and offer. And in part, it's the only game in town on some of these topics. Uh, End of Empire from Compass. Um, that's a very interesting looking game. And obviously I got other games on the American Revolution at a couple of different scales. I don't have like a huge collection of American Revolution stuff, but I have a few. Um, uh, Fucko, not really. <laughs> I'd like to look at it, but I don't need to. I, I do not need to own a copy of Scrimmage. I really thank you, but I, I really don't. Um, he's, he's giving them away, folks. He's you can't give them away. Um, so I did. Um, so Carl mentioned solo games that he never uh, uh, never plays, but keeps buying them. So I've been re, uh, you know, I did buy a, a large pile of solitaire items from White Dog, which does a lot of solitaire stuff. 
Um, and I dumped a bunch of those. I kept a couple, um, but I dumped a bunch of those. Uh, or or they're in the 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 the, the should go away pile now, that is. Um and <laughs> I'll be I'll be receiving 18 copies of scrimmage in the mail over the next couple of weeks. Um Uh, Norik Maelstrom would like to get great. Uh, so it's just battles of the American Revolution. There's nothing great about it. Um, actually, I hear the series is very good. I have the tri pack, uh, and I'm just sticking with the tri packs. Um, there's a tri pack two on its way, um, but uh, it it looks very promising. Let me put it that way. Um, so I I got rid of a bunch of solitaire stuff, and right now solitaire stuff is. That shelf, and there's a shelf above it, which is about half full. I've got some kind of splinter in my thumb, don't I? I totally do. It's probably from yard work. Um, uh, so I'm not doing too bad on solitaire stuff, uh, but, but I've been pretty hesitant. And I guess Mr. President goes on that shelf too. Um, but... Um, I, I've held back fairly successfully on solitaire games in the last, um, couple of years, say two years or so. Now I have asked gaming has been fascinated with the Spanish, English, French colonization, of North America. What game would scratch this itch for me? I mean, it would be hard to recommend anything more highly than Richard Berg's conquistador. I think that's not where the historiography is at right now. Um, I think it from that standpoint, it's going to uh it's going to seem dated, but I think the game is engaging. Um so there's that. I mean, everything from VUCA looks nice, right? I mean, I could I could have bought uh and that this is a great example of a um of a game I chose not to buy, even though it looks fantastic, right? A, a 1914 Nach Paris from VUCA. That looks great. I'm interested in the topic, but the fact is I've got three games on that topic already at a couple of different scales. So I don't really see, I didn't see the need for me to pick that up as well. So um, that's not important. Uh, and there, there is a rules revision to that as well. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, so thanks for the folks who, who have, uh, contributed and, and, uh, mention it in the chat here. So Alistair can match your, your contributions if you have not done so already. Um, I bought a pile of Labatai games. I didn't really buy too many of the old ones. I got an Auerstadt, um, and there's, I got one other old one too. And other than that, I just bought whatever Clash of Arms either had in print or or had just recently gone out of print so I didn't have to pay a ruinous price for it. I am 100% comfy with waiting for whatever Clash of Arms and or Marshall Enterprises would like to put out for a Labatai, and I'll buy those. I don't need all the old ones. I'm good. Um, there's already, I've already got five, six, seven of them. I mean, I'm good. I'm, I'm good on that. So John Clark has also donated. Thank you, John. Much appreciated. Um, so I have, in one of the videos that you'll be seeing from me over the next few weeks, I'm not sure which video it is, um, you'll hear me say some fairly negative things about Columbia Games' victory, none of which apply to Pacific victory, which is basically the same system, but which is actually on a real historical map instead of a, a, an abstract fantasy land. Um, completely different experience, in my opinion, for that reason. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I, I said, no, so it, it looks great. It looks great. It, it's getting a, a, a lot of great press. Um, it's getting, it's getting played. Um, that's always a good sign that it's getting played, right? If nobody's playing it as Stigler points out, right. If, if there's a big splash and then you don't hear about anybody playing it, then that, that is a thing to maybe bear in mind. Um, other things that have come out have gotten immediate play. Um, I do feel like BCS specifically took a few years to catch on. Um, 
I, I don't think it really caught on until after Brazen Chariots. I think that was the uh, the sort of the breakout game, if you will, for BCS. I think that that's where we started seeing the newer rules that were say substantial improvement over the original rules. We, we saw uh, um, uh, we saw the stripe uh, formation stripes on the counters, which is a big help. Um, so John, thanks so much for that. Do not, you know, don't, don't give what you can't give, but, uh, but thanks for that, that for the last time around when we had that benefit show and brazen chariots is fantastic. I can vouch for brazen chariots and we played, uh, Mark Kerman is here. Thanks Mark for stopping by. Um, so I've got some playthrough video of brazen chariots and, I feel like we were reasonably negative about it. Not super duper negative, but um, we were somewhat negative about it originally when we were filming that. And fortunately, um, that was the last game to release with the pre 2.0 rules. I think, I think, I think I'm getting the numbers right. Maybe I'm not, but there was another, you know, another revision after brazen chariots that I think did make a significant difference. Um, there are, were some things that we stumbled across that I think we were just doing wrong. Um, and I think it's easy to do that in BCS, to make an assumption about it working this way. And I think I saw it in the book, and then it doesn't work that way. Um, so so there's that. Um, so, yes, I kind of agree with this. But there is sort of a healthy book in the BCS games that uh, will help you uh, kind of absorb the different concepts if you read it. Um, and I think Brazen Chariots is a really nice overall package. So it's it's Operation Crusader, okay? Uh, but it also, because they take place in the same area on the same map, you also get Battle Axe and Brevity. Um, so there's like, like a lot of rich scenarios and all that stuff. Um, Stringler points out that 1914 Knock Paris isn't complicated, but because it does so much more differently than you'd expect, it has a layer of crunchiness. That might be this, you know, a, a, a similar situation. Um, this is what I found. Um, it it did take a while to click. Um, we, our first whirl at it was me and Fucko uh, played um, uh, B Baptism by Fire, and it we, we were like there was a lot of head scratching. We didn't hate it. It it just we were like I'm not really sure we're doing this right. Um, but then you start seeing um, you know people play it and and absorbing the the knowledge that they have, and then Doug did his big. Uh, epic playthrough series of last blitzkrieg and that helped enormously frankly that gives you even if you don't like pay attention to every little mechanical fiddly bit um that gives you a really good sense of bcs flow of play um and i found that incredibly uh valuable um and it the, the 2.0 rules update really does help too i i really think it does uh mo from mo's game table mo is here thanks mo for stopping by and Richard Coker, welcome back. Nice to have you back. Uh, yeah, this sounds right. I, and I think we may have, Carl, we may have passed in the in the, in the night on uh, back around that time on Constable about it as well. Uh, then again, that may have been Dean too. I'm not sure, but yeah, that's this sounds about about right. So, ooh, look at that. Uh, Mark Herman worked with Dean on 2.0 downgraded armor barrage capability. I'd have to compare that actually. I'm not, I'm not, I only because we just spent the last seven months playing last Blitzkrieg with the 2.0 rules. I really only have it in my head how 2.0 works. So, um, and we'll totally play, totally play BCS more in the future. We need to break from it now because we spent the last 77 months doing it. But, um, so, Oh, and since he's here, Mark, uh, you know, I'm going to just show that off. But that just came in today, so so that is a thing that that happened. Um, and I, you know, I'm the guy that says I don't really need any more Cold War Ghost Hot stuff. That's an over big topic, in my opinion. I got too many games on it. Or, well, here's another one. Um, so that is a thing that happens from time to time. Um, another thing that I recently acquired, and this was at Origins, I think this was at Origins, Under the Southern Cross. Um, now, I haven't played that yet, but I have played the system. That's the Flying Colors system. 
And that's another one where it's a series, and I didn't list it because there's only four games in it, and they're all standalones as well. Um, but that's another one that I played the series, and I like the series, and I'll continue to buy it until the designer does something I don't like. So um, uh, this is totally true. Uh, so the, the exception here, Carl, is Guderian's Blitzkrieg. Uh, Guderian's Blitzkrieg won, not uh, not uh, bueno with the current uh, OCS rules. But other than that, I think that's absolutely correct. Uh, no, that's actually not true. There's one one more exception: Force Eagles War. I don't I don't think you can retrofit the current TCS rules into Force Eagles War either. So now the next this next war is completely different from the GMT Next War series. Totally different. So, uh, so the interesting thing too, the, the under the Southern Cross was like a topic of interest, right? Um, there's, there's, you know, there's not a lot on South American Age of Sail War at Sea stuff, right? So, um, so I felt justified in that context. Um, another recent acquisition was on to Richmond too, um, which, you know, that's a no brainer for me. It's not like that ain't going to get played. Um, in fact, I think that, uh, I think, What game system are you talking about here, Nordic Maelstrom? Because I wanna, I wanna understand that. Um, yeah, this is actually, a, a, this is actually an interesting subject, and I don't know that we're necessarily giving it its due in the wargaming hobby. Um, so, did they? I, am I nuts, or did they pick a different name for Beneath the Southern Cross? Um, so this is. Um, Yes. Um, I, I'm trying to remember the designer's name. Um, over at Compass, they're doing it. Basically, it's, it was described originally as a flat top on steroids, and I think it has evolved considerably since then, but I think you'll still see the flat top DNI in it. Um, I thought that they had renamed it, but I could be wrong. Mo might know. Uh, the next the next GMT next war series is Iran, and that could be interesting. Yeah, I don't I don't necessarily have an opinion. I have not with Bill Cooper. Yep, there you go. Thank you, Carl. Um, and I've talked to Bill about this and it sounds very promising and it sounds like, you know, pro progress was slow for a while. And then it really picked up over the last couple of years. I know he's been working on it for a long time. He sounds like a huge flat top fan as, as are we all. Um, and for anybody that's played it anyway, except for those of us who hated it. So that's fair. Uh, but I love flat top. Um, so I, I will be very interested in seeing that. Now somebody mentioned up thread, and I wanted to get to this, but but uh, that Bill Thomas had mentioned the Pacific games don't seem to sell as well as other topics do, and I, I wonder if that's not the topic, but the games, right? Um, I'm not sure how many Pacific games Compass has done. They've done Pacific Tide and now Oceans of Fire. Have they done any other ones? Am I missing? And and uh, I guess Carrier Battles Philippine Sea, right? Um. So hmm. that's 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 less awesome. <laughs> I was also having this problem though, where I was mixing these two games up beneath the Southern Cross and under the Southern Cross. Um so oh Mark Mark has set up USN. I, you know, I'm now this was not a game that was on my radar, and now I'm hearing a lot of people tell me how good. Um, USN was so. Um, well, I'll tell you what, Compass. I, I'm not sure it is because the fact is that Compass has some really good, strong World War One games, right? Uh, the lamps are going out, is which I've never played. I have it, I haven't played it. Um, that's uh, got some very good, uh, and I've seen people play that, right? That gets played. Um, there's yeah, the, um, there's, 
uh, Balance of Powers, which I think is a very strong game, which is sold out. There's Empires and Alliances, which is kind of Rob Bama's updated take on Guns of August. That I, I can't vouch for that, but there are people that like that. Every year at Compass Expo, there's people playing it, um, and it's sold out. So clearly it it wasn't, you know, it 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 did reasonably well. Um, there's the Red Poppy series from John Gorkowski that's done reasonably well and which is fairly well regarded, and which I have two of. Um Uh, yeah, this is true. This is a good point. The Pacific side of the war. And as Matt Davidson points out, war in the wind, um, which I believe is that Atu and Kiska. Um, and then the Island, uh, CSS games, which is true, but I feel like those are, I, I think those are real promising, but I, I also understand why people would balk at those. Right. Um, Uh, Kyle Harris is awaiting a World War One game that gets recommended to him. The titles aren't always obvious. What kind of World War One game would you like? Is there a specific end of World War One? Do you want the whole thing or what? Uh, Mark says that USN is an interesting experiment worth looking at. Many great ideas and concepts in it. I'm going to have to give that a look because it comes up in my search for an empty war in the Pacific box that I have set up on eBay. The thing that actually comes up is USN. Um, so I'll have to... Uh, um, I'll have to take a look at that. Uh, Marty says the CSS invasion games seem more like bug hunts than any sort of interesting play for the Japanese side. I think this is a very reasonable criticism. Um, it's not really a criticism. It's it's a feature of the topic, right? Um, so I don't consider myself bashing Adam for having done these. I think I, I'd love to see more uh, Island Warfare games. Um, but the fact is that they're, they are difficult to manage to get uh, to keep engaging for both sides um i don't know if it's his favorite but it's definitely one of his favorites i don't know if he said actual favorite uh, so you're talking about the css system i assume that was a typo um i, uh, I always balk at remake here um it's fair to call that a, just kind of an updated take on a lot of the same ideas. Uh, I should be at Compass Expo along with a bunch of other of us, uh, so that'll be all good. Um, Fatal, oh, Fatal Alliance is three. That's another good one. That's another one that they still got that in stock last I heard. Well, so I bought two copies, one for me, one for Fucko, last year at Compass Expo, and I think they, they were running low at that point, so they may be sold out by now. Uh, but I've got Fatal Alliances 3, and I, I may even play it at Compass Expo. If anybody wants to play Fatal Alliances 3 at Compass Expo, please reach out to me at ardwolfslayer at gmail.com. Um, I think there's an excellent chance of that getting played. I got to check the uh, list. Um, Ryan Jarvis says, depends on the scale of Pacific War game. If you played one island invasion game, you played them all. Operational strategic has better scales for the Pacific. Uh well, that versus the island invasion, yeah, I would agree with that. There's actually some fairly interesting stuff happening in China at various times uh, that we've seen relatively few games on. There's an Operation Ichigo game that came out from, it might have been against the odds, and it might have been World at War, I forget. Um, that looks fairly interesting. Uh, Frank says that... The lamps are going out. It is a great strategic World War One game. I hear a lot of that. Um, I I have a feeling I would end up preferring Paths of Glory to it, but that does not take anything away from lamps are going out, right? Gentleman cries. Uh, Mark Hodgkinson says that Fatal Alliances Three is the best World War One strategic game. Um, and Mark Moe says that Pacific is a tough theater due to size and scope. What do you want to cover? Naval only, naval and ground, naval and, 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 and you, including air one way or the other. Um, I don't know if I'd say, well, starter game for people who've played war games before. Uh, Pass of Glory is fairly complicated by the standards of the kind of game that it is. Um, <clears throat> Joseph Syverson uh, was pretty impressed with Der Weltkrieg, but decided to go with Labatai instead. Um, I think that... I think there's more options. Sort of, so 
let's call Labatai Tactical and let's call their Veltkrieg operational. I think that's definitely true in the case of Labatai, and it's a little bit oversimplified and or reductive in the case of Der Weltkrieg. Um, there's plenty of tactical Napoleonics, or at least grand tactical Napoleonics. Um, then again, for Labatai, you do get a good selection of battles, depending on how much stuff you're willing to hunt down. Um, whereas Operational World War I, I feel like there's a little less. Uh, if I did an actual survey of that, I might come up with a different, um, a different answer. Um, Ray Garvey mentions Death in the Trenches, which I have and which looks fairly promising. It's a Ben Madison West Army design. It looks somewhat similar to um, Absolute Victory by the same design team. I'm about done clipping counters here. Um, in the sense that it seems to be event-driven and that I find that quite interesting. So... Just gonna point out that if you watch the show from like you go back to counter clipping show number 10 and just observe the the relative paucity of gray hair in that video, and then re recall that I guess it's only been uh two years or so since the first couple of these. It's been more than that, but not much more, two and a half maybe. Um we're actually coming up on three years, aren't we? Yeah, we are. We're coming up on almost three years of this show. Holy cow. Mo says that Fatal Alliances is still available. I know there's some typos on the um uh, on the um Death in the Trenches counters. Um Okinawa might, uh, but part of that's just that Okinawa, you know, as a place is enormous, so much bigger than the, a lot of the other islands. Um, so that's a factor. And that may mean that there's more room for maneuver. Um, Nordic Maelstrom asks, has any game company made a solitaire game for commanding World War II ships like destroyers, cruisers, and battleships? Um, not sure about cruisers or battleships or destroyers, uh, but there is um, what's that solitaire game from Legion. Um, there's Devil Boats, but that's about Devil Boats. Um, and that does not come particularly highly recommended, I gotta say. Um, there's, um, oh, I'm trying to remember what it was called. Somebody in the chat will know. It's a solitaire game where you're playing, a, um, I think it's at the Naval Battle of Guadalcanal where you got a bunch of, um, maybe it's later, I forget. Picket Duty is the game I'm thinking of. Um, where you're playing the individual ship. And that looks reasonably intriguing. And I was going to pick that up at one point, and that was several years ago. And it, I think it's been through a couple of printings now, to be honest. I might be wrong about that. So we're packing this up. Uh, Picket duty is uh, Picket duty is Okinawa. There you go. So land Okinawa or sea Okinawa anyway. So there's that. I'm gonna have a just a crap load of additional pieces here. These uh, little dividers work really well for this, uh, by the way. Brian Jarvis says, the silver lining of COVID, we realized we like to sit around in front of the computer every week to chat about the hobby. Uh, I mean, it's worked out good for me. Um, you know, I'm fundamentally, as I've pointed out, nobody believes me when I say this, but I'm fundamentally pretty antisocial. Um, those are two different colors, aren't they? Yes. It's fine. It's fine. Greens and this purple guy, purple guy. All right, so we're done clipping for the night. We've clipped uh, a lot of counters, and I am feeling fairly unwell. So I may, uh... yeah, I don't know about enough about the actual tactical 
engagements on Okinawa to say if this might be interesting or not. So I think Joe's Joe is Joe is reluctant to say that that's true. Uh, I mean, there was a lot of this in the Pacific, right? It, on on the islands specifically. So on Atlantic Sentinels will be destroyers. Yeah, that's a that's a good uh, a, a fair point, and that's coming from Compass Soonish, I think. Um, and there's been a couple games on Okinawa as well. So. All right, folks. So I think we are going to um, we're going to actually cut the show early tonight. I, I apologize for that. But um, otherwise, I'm going to take at least two more breaks while I go hit the can. Um, and I'm not sure that that's a great idea. I'll try and answer as many questions as I can in a shotgun style format. So ask away if you got them. Uh, Perry Spiropoulos says, what do I think of GMT's 1914 series? I've heard really good things about it. It's definitely a kind of a mouthful to get your head around. Um, I've got all three of them. I will buy another one if another one comes out. Um, but if, in the meantime, I have not played any of them. So um, I hope uh, I hope to at some point in the future. And maybe that's another another book to um, uh uh, another book to look at. So, uh, Joe Perez says, uh, best book to read about Ekina Okinawa is Tenozan. I'm probably mispronouncing that. I apologize. Uh, yes, uh, this is, I, uh, uh, Pravidis Albi, and I, I, I didn't, I didn't see if you corrected anything, anything that you might've corrected there. So, um, Ichigo was a big land campaign. Yes. Uh, HUN644, thank you very much. Yeah. I mean, I'm not miserable, but I've gone through like a, almost a whole bottle of Pepto at this point. I, I think it's some kind of stomach bug. Mark, thanks so much. Um, Eric Goebel, uh, thanks uh, so much. I, I wish we would have got, we've been a little more focused, but then again, I wasn't really quite focused enough tonight um, for a couple of reasons. Zerbian Moose Sterbian, I believe. And Carl Crater from the War Game Boot Camp, thanks so much. Much appreciated. Uh, Alistair is, we're still going, so if you want to slip one in at the last second, uh, we'll be back. John C. from the sunny Philippines is finally here. We'll have to watch the rest of the show on replay because we're packing it in because Gary's got the runs. So more, more information was imparted this evening than you were planning to get, and I apologize for that. Um, so we're canning it right now. So once again, thanks, everybody, for coming out. We do have a full slate of stuff uh, headed out this week. There is a video tomorrow for Harn. Uh, the new Harn hardcover, so check that out. There will be a video on Thursday, with which is going to be the unboxing for North Africa 41, assuming I can edit it from the toilet. Um, and then uh, Thursday night, we've got the show with Dan. We're going to have Gina Willis on, which is very exciting. Um, and then on Friday, we're going to have a special top secret video from the top secret OCS. He's posted pictures of it. It's not that secret. A bunch of the OCS superstars are all sitting in a room in Baltimore right now playing a super secret play test project. We're going to talk to those folks about that on Friday at 4 p.m. It's just the time that it worked out. So I'm going to go chug some more Pepto and sit on the can for another hour. So thanks, everybody. And uh, we will see you all next week, if not earlier than that.